introduction of technology into medicine is unmistakable and revolutionary in our ability to monitor patients, to communicate with patients, to integrate information, and to ultimately uh, enable decision making in a much more efficient and accurate way. I have a very rich career that involves work both as a basic scientist, as a translational scientist, but also overseeing clinical trials, all dedicated to the study and ultimate treatment and cure of liver diseases. At the same time, I have a role for the institution as the Dean for Therapeutic Discovery, in which I try to integrate all the elements that are essential to discover new targets, to create new drugs, and to commercialize them so they get to patients. Medicine at the bedside hasn't changed. People still need doctors, they need hope, they need reassurance, they need their questions answered. But by relying more on technology, we can find more definitive answers to difficult questions. Another transformative impact of technology has been imaging. When I was a medical student, all we had was ultrasound, then CT that uh, was inaccessible and very crude images. Now we have MR, PET scanning, uh, high-grade ultrasound, multicolor imaging, all of this leading to much more accurate diagnosis, detection of earlier disease, and ultimately improved patient outcomes. For patient care, uh, the transformation has been enormous in creating electronic medical records, standardizing the capture of information. You know, in the old days, you'd have to send someone down, or if it was me as an intern, to a, a, a dusty record room and dig for paper files that often were missing. And that left major gaps in our ability to know where the patient had been uh, treatment-wise and disease-wise. And now all that information is embedded in electronic medical records that are always accessible, even from home, through a password-protected uh, portal. So that means we can communicate more directly with patients from wherever we are uh, with access to all their medical information in an accurate and timely way. You know, at our institution, we're really committed to uh, creating a new culture that embraces innovation, uses big data approaches to solve big problems in a unique and important way. Uh, and one of the ways to create that culture is to enhance uh, the awareness of new opportunities to integrate skills, uh, to work together in teams. We've held events such as what we called our MedMaker Challenge, we're now calling a healthathon, uh, that uh, is comprised of teams that aggregate in order to solve a specific question. And they came up with solutions over a two-day period that really astonished uh, those of us who had organized the event, far beyond our expectations. We're in the midst of a transformative time with the need to integrate technologies, expertise, and skill sets. And we are open to and in fact embrace the opportunity to partner with commercial entities uh, that have software solutions, that have hardware solutions, that have new ideas. We have partnerships across the gamut in order to bring those state-of-the-art solutions to bear on our problems. We bring to the challenge uh, clinical knowledge, often uh, a sense of what patients need. We don't always have the technological skills, and that's really where our partners come in. They provide often the tools or the templates to create new paradigms for monitoring patients and, and determining treatments. And I think you can't do that with the skills that come from being a physician or a scientist. You need people that have skills that complement those. I will never be a data programmer. I will never be a software designer. Uh, but I'm uh, increasingly appreciative of the importance of those skills in creating new solutions in healthcare and in research. Our institution has invested heavily in big data and in individuals who carry many skills that were not traditionally found within an academic medical center. A beautiful example is the work of Dr. Joel Dudley, who's the director of our Institute for Next Generation Healthcare. Joel and his team published a very important paper last year that identified three subtypes of type 2 diabetes that would have never been apparent to clinicians taking care of those patients. And he did so by integrating multiple data sets 
the clinical record, the electronic medical record for laboratories, genetic information, and lo and behold, this simple disease or single disease is really three separate diseases, and the implications for that are really profound. It could mean different diagnostics, different risk factors, different treatments. All of this kind of information is only available to us with big data approaches and integrated software that really is able to crunch that data in a way that a single individual can conceive. The pace of change is so astonishing that it's sometimes hard to predict. Nonetheless, I think it's safe to say that our investment in precision medicine for most diseases in the long term will translate into a wholly new approach to patient care. A patient will walk into a doctor's office. That doctor will have genomic information that's been distilled into actionable items that can influence uh, what the patient, what medication the patient takes, how often they should be followed, what their risk of specific diseases are, and what protective measures can be implemented to reduce the risk of disease, both to them and to their genetic, to their family. One of the exciting ways that technology is creating new opportunities for us is by using databases that allow us to identify whether existing drugs might be beneficial for new indication. And we can interrogate databases that will tell us, well, that drug, even though it was intended for another disease, may work really well in liver disease or in kidney disease. And the ability to repurpose drugs strictly based on big data analyses will greatly shorten the availability of those drugs as new treatments for diseases. It was unimaginable to use in silico methods to identify potentially new drugs, uh, or I should say old drugs for new diseases without doing any wet bench experiments. And yet we've been able to do that as have others here at Mount Sinai. When I started as a liver specialist, we basically had no liver specific treatments. Now, 25 years later, we have astonishingly effective treatments for viral disease, we have extraordinary imaging, and we have new capacity to interrogate the genome of normal cells and of cancer. Whereas 25 years ago, we would give very nonspecific therapies like diuretics or water pills. Now we make precise diagnoses of viral disease with sequences of the virus to know what drugs are likely to be most effective. We can monitor those patients with highly sophisticated blood tests that quantify viral load. We know that they're at risk for cancer, so now we can monitor them with MR and CT that are highly sensitive and can pick up small nascent tumors as small as one centimeter or less. So the idea that uh, basic analyses and basic studies of liver scarring by identifying a new cell in the liver are now translating into new treatments that are in clinical trials, well, that's as good as it gets when you're a physician.